Uh, uh, one is that, as you know, that uh, in last session that when we were talking about the Greensboro uh, case, that uh, we had uh, some footage that we were going to show you, uh, <coughs> which shows the kind of graphic uh, events that actually, here we go. Uh, the, that, uh, oh, there, <laughs> that, uh, that transpired in, in Greensboro. Uh, and so we have that for you today that we want to show you at the beginning of the, of the class here, just because I don't want you to miss it, uh, to see what it's like in real life. Uh, the other matter is that, as you'll recall, early in the course I pointed out that, uh, that things had degenerated to the point where there was the passage of the National Defense Authorization Act uh, by the Congress, and it was signed into law by President Obama at 11.55 uh, at night on New Year's Eve of 2011, uh, and that it had a provision in it, Section 1021, that, uh, that actually for the first time expressly uh, authorized the president or his designee to, to declare that a person, including American citizens, were suspected of being engaged in lending material support to uh, a, an organization that had, ex that had expressed uh, belligerent uh, activity toward the United States or its allies, uh, and that they could be detained without warrant, without resort to habeas corpus, without the right to uh, have any trial at all. They could be detained indefinitely, uh, and that they could be detained under military uh, conditions, in a military stockade. Uh, and that, uh, uh, as you may have gathered from my uh, presentation of it, I found this to be, you know, blatantly unconstitutional in violation of several different provisions, if not all of the provisions of the Constitution. Uh, but in any event, uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, the United States District Court in New York City, the Southern District of New York, <coughs> declared it unconstitutional. Uh, now, that's the right initial response. The, the, the challenge is, and that people aren't quite aware of this because it's kind of a technicality, while well, they're going around celebrating, everybody rejoicing about uh, how obvious this is, this has been declared unconstitutional, the reality is that it only applies to the single federal district in New York. Uh, so it only covers basically Manhattan, uh, the southern district of New York. Uh, so all the rest of the districts, all 11 uh, other circuits, and the entire rest of the second circuit uh, are still under the threat uh, of this. Uh, I met uh, this afternoon uh, with, uh, with uh, Ryan Coonerty, the, uh, the co-mayor uh, of the city, uh, and asked him, in light of the federal decision, uh, the first evaluation on the part of any objective uh, tribunal of this act, declaring it you know, transparently unconstitutional, whether he would support uh, asking the council to declare uh, the city of Santa Cruz a civil rights enforcement zone uh, where th this particular uh, statute would not be allowed to be enforced by the federal government. He is supportive of that. They, they are writing a letter which they're issuing opposing the act. He is recommending us to the county board of supervisors uh, since they're in charge of the sheriff's department. And the sheriff's department is uh, is a much larger and more effective law enforcement operation than the city police in Santa Cruz, uh, and they're uh, they're better armed actually. And uh, and if they're they were actually going to have any kind of effective uh, enforcement of this, that the county would have to be involved. But he will be supportive of it and will write letters of recommendation uh, for that action by the county. So that if any of you are, are interested uh, in knowing more about it or participating in it, uh, having the, both our city and our county, then later our congressional district, and eventually the entire state, uh, declared a civil uh, constitutional rights or civil rights enforcement zone, uh, you can talk with me about it afterwards. Last quarter, uh, I had a class with him called Constitutional Law, yes. and we went over the Pentagon Papers, and I, that's when I met you. Uh -huh. So like I told the whole class how like you were doing some crazy thing with the Pentagon and yeah, <coughs> that's how I referred. Well, so he, so he's uh, he's uh, going to be supportive of this, and 
So it's, it's going to be a very, I mean, it, it would be great to have Santa Cruz and Santa Cruz County and our congressional district with the Congressman uh, Sam Farr uh, to be the first people on board declaring this to be a free zone, uh, basically. We're, we're not seceding from the Union or anything. Uh, we're just seceding from that part of it. Um, have you heard of the ACLU's 100-mile uh, uh, constitution <coughs> zone against uh, uh, any ocean? Against any ocean? Yeah, all the borders that outline cities that are along the ocean side are considered constitution-free zones where the border control could go 100 miles inland, and at which point you have no constitutional rights. Oh, we'll have to cover that one next. Uh, yeah, but uh, I, 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 I had a long discussion with the the uh, director of the Northern California American Civil Liberties Union about this particular thing. And he had mentioned something about that. Uh, so, well, let's get this one first, and then let's get that one second. Uh, but, but the fact is, it's the only way that you're going to be able to effectively protect yourself. Because they, guys like John Yu and David Addington, actually take your acquiescence as being an affirmative support for their activity like that. And they actually draft legal memos saying so. Okay? So you can't just acquiesce to this type of stuff. Why is it preferable to have it be declared in a civil rights zone than to have the courts declared unconstitutional in our region? Oh, no, that, that too. No, that too. Uh, the, the, the challenge is that that's kind of, a, uh, of an avant-garde uh, kind of tactic. It's kind of a, you know, asking the other kind of ruling elite to pass on that. And it's good to get that kind of support. But the, the reality is that, that to not have the grassroots citizenry outraged at this being done to us sends a signal to these people that tend to encourage them. Uh, and that then they, they have a lot more ways of getting at judges and others, you know, to keep them from doing anything about it if there isn't this, this groundswell of citizen action. So this is extremely uh, important for you to you know, keep in mind what, what this is going to be. So you can talk to me about it uh, later if you'd like. Okay, now the second issue is here is, here is the, the footage. Uh, you can go on to the internet uh, under Greensboro Massacre which is actually the colloquial phrase that is used to refer to this. And you can find like four different videos of this. Uh, one of them as much as is 12 minutes long. Uh, this is the one, this is Amy Goodman's presentation uh, of the attack that took place in Greensboro. Okay? So that we'll, we'll look at this, then we'll get on to the, the topic of the Carthay and murder trial. Change Democracy Now! The War and Peace Report, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. On November 3, 1979, at the corner of Carver and Everett Streets, black and white demonstrators gathered to march through Greensboro, North Carolina, a legal demonstration against the Ku Klux Klan. A caravan of Klansmen and Nazis pull up to the protesters and open fire. 88 seconds later, five demonstrators lie dead, 10 others wounded from the gunfire, recorded on camera by four TV stations. Four women have lost their husbands. Three children have lost their fathers. After two criminal trials, not a single gunman has spent a day in prison, although a civil trial won an unprecedented victory for the victims. For one of the only times in U.S. history, a jury held local police liable for cooperating with the Ku Klux Klan in a wrongful death. That's the introduction to the book, Through Survivors' Eyes, from the 60s to the Greensboro Massacre written by one of the survivors, Sally Bermanson. This month marks the 25th anniversary of the Greensboro Massacre. Today we speak with two of the survivors. But first, let's go back to that fateful day 25 years ago. We can take our country back to the Congress Party. We can take it back from the niggers. It's time for us to band together. If we have to get in the streets and find blood up to our knees, by God, it's time to get ready to fight.
there were several police in the area and then uh, until after uh, uh, these murderers left, police came in immediately and started arresting people who were trying to help those who had fallen. Nelson Johnson you know, was taken into custody, kicked in the head uh, by the police. He was bleeding from the arm as he was trying to help people. And the police did this directly or indirectly. Jim Waters, one of the camera people that day, put together a piece called The Guns of November 3rd. This month marks the 25th anniversary of the Greensboro Massacre. Last weekend, as many as 700 people marched to Greensboro City Hall following the route of the planned 79 march. They finished the march that never was completed 25 years ago. <coughs> the survivors of the Greensboro Massacre are forming the country's first Truth and Reconciliation Commission based on the South African model. We're joined by Reverend Nelson Johnson, survivor of the Greensboro Massacre, one of the organizers of the anti-Klan rally of 1979, now the executive director of the beloved community center in Greensboro. Also in our studio here in New York, Sally Bermanson, one of the survivors also of the massacre, in which her husband, Paul, was critically wounded. She's now associate professor of politics at Brooklyn College, where she teaches classes on politics, race, and gender, and she has authored the book Through Survivor's Eyes, the 60s through the Greensboro Massacre. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Sally Burns and um, the beginning of the video audio clip that we just played, uh, we heard a man, you know, talking about uh, uh, going after African Americans um, uh, using the N-word. Who was he? His name was Virgil Griffin. He was, a, he is still a leader of a clan, um, and he was in the lead car that came in and attacked our march. So that man that we saw addressing a crowd yes. that you had footage of yes. uh, came then and attacked the protest. Why the protest? Well, let me put that question to Reverend Nelson Johnson since you were one of the organizers of it. Why did you protest that day on November 3rd? Where were you trying to get to? From where to where? Well, we got to the same place we should be trying to get to now. Um, that we were actually doing labor organizing and racial justice organizing uh, and the Klan uh, and that way of thinking, <clears throat> whether it's named Klan or not, uh, resisted that. And one of the most virulent forms of uh, trying to uh, create fear and promote falsehood and gender confusion through the threat and the use of force has been the Klan. It was so very important, and is so very important, uh, that people <coughs> stand for justice, resistance. So the short answer is that it was absolutely necessary to have some expression of opposition to racism as manifest by the client in order to continue with the work of labor organizing in the textile industry, and in order to continue with the work of uniting uh, people from different racial backgrounds. Uh, those questions were necessary, and that was at the base of the reason for the march in 1979. Sally, so explain how it went down that day on November 3rd. What time did you gather? We gathered, the march was supposed to start at noon at, by, at 11.23, while we were just gathering um, before the march began. Uh, this caravan drove up and open fire. Did you know anything was going to happen? No, we had no idea. It was, um, it, we had a legal police permit. The police were supposed to be there to protect the march like they do for every other march. Uh, there were no police around. Um, actually, there were police who were following the caravan in who knew its every move as it approached us, and they knew that it had guns, they had watched them all morning, they were in direct contact with the, the headquarters, police headquarters, they followed this death squad as it approached us, as it pulled out guns and opened fire and killed five people. 
So there actually were police there, although they were not in uniform, and they did nothing, nothing to protect the demonstrators, even though that was their obligation. What happened to your husband, Paul? He was shot in the head and the arm. He um, is still partially paralyzed from that. He had five hours of surgery that night. Um, no, we really were very, it was wonderful that he survived. It was a surprise that he survived. Reverend Nelson Johnson, did you recognize people who were shooting you? Uh, I did not. Um, at the, uh, I later came to understand that one of the men uh, who was driving the lead vehicle had been at a press conference that we held. Uh, and he was the agent of the Greensboro Police Department, who was also a clansman and an informant for the FBI. And he was the person to whom the Greensboro Police Department gave the parade permit either before or at about the same time that it was given to us. And that is a, a long story that I won't get you into, but it was hard for us to get the parade permit and all the clearances. Um, and there was never any reason given other than people were out of town and things that just doesn't work for a government. Uh, that's, that's not the way a government works. Reverend Johnson, what happened to you that day? Well, I um, actually was very close to Sally Bramerson, and uh, uh, a Nazi member charged me with a knife, and uh, fortunately someone threw me a stick, and I was defending myself. So I got uh, cut about the hands and um, stabbed through the arm as the person was trying to cut my midsection. In the video footage, we see the police going after you, is that right? Well, uh, because I negotiated uh, the uh, parade permit with the police, I perhaps more than anyone else was pretty clear that the whole arrangement uh, that we made with the police had been betrayed. And I stood up to say that there's any way, there isn't any way that this could happen without the police, and police then came and demanded that I be quiet. And uh, when I refused to do so, they arrested me and threw me to the ground. And uh, the man who became the police chief had his foot on my neck. Uh, and I was bleeding pretty profusely at the time from the night wound. So that may be some of what you're referring to. Did they arrest you? Mm -hmm. They arrested me and held me, did not set up on. Um, as a matter of fact, I had seven charges brought against me directly growing out of the incident of 1979. And I have been in jail under um, a bond twice that of any class person. I was once in jail for $150,000, uh, allegedly for using bad language. Uh, and um, classmen were in for murder for $50,000. So, if you work with that, it gives you a sense of the atmosphere, which was uh, unbelievable, except for those of us who were in it. Uh, it. It's not something that I often share in detail because it doesn't really make sense to many people around the country. Sally Bermanson, we only have a minute, and I wanted to ask about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's the first in this country explaining what's happening. Well, it's a project of the broad sectors of the Greensboro community, the, the religious sectors from all different types of religious groups, um, the universities, the student governments, um, civic and, and um, civil rights organizations, as well as the survivors have been uh, very involved in it. Um, it's the first um, Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission in the United States, and it's also the first one worldwide that is based in a city that's a, 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 a individual community process. I think that um, it's a wonderful model that could address all kinds of other racial violence that this country has been so plagued by for hundreds of years. The former mayor of the city, Jim Melvin, is opposed to the formation of this? Yes, he is. Why? Well, um, he was uh, that he was the mayor when this happened. It was his police who um, did not uh, protect the demonstrators, and who and he uh, played a big role in at least 
covering up what had actually gone on. Well, we hope to come back to the story. It's a very important one. I want to thank you both, Sally Bermanson and the Reverend Nelson Johnson, for joining us. Sally Bermanson's book is called Through Survivor's Eyes, From the 60s to the Greensboro Massacre. It was just published. It's the 20th anniversary of the Greensboro Massacre. That does the show. So, so uh, this, this brings us to the, the second of the cases that we were working on uh, back then. As you recall, uh, this event had taken place in November of 1979. Uh, by, the, by the July of 1981, we were deeply engaged in, the, in pursuing the discovery efforts in the, in the Greensboro case, trying to get a special prosecutor appointed uh, because the Reagan-Bush administration had uh, changed course dramatically from the original investigation that had been initiated by Drew Days uh, under the Carter administration. Uh, and so we were very much taken up with that. We came back uh, from one of our, our many trips down into Greensboro, back into our, our new offices in Washington, D.C., this little cobbler shop that we had been given at the bottom of Capitol Hill. As I mentioned, the, the staff was living out at the, uh, the abandoned uh, convent out next to uh, Catholic University in the National Catholic Cathedral. And we had this nifty old convent there that uh, had 40 acres of land and we had a big organic garden and uh, uh, we were all living there together uh, doing this work. Uh, and uh, over that uh, 4th of July weekend uh, in 1981, uh, or on the 6th of July, we received a telephone call. Uh, uh, at, at our place, at a Rupe house, at the house where we were living, from a member of the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. Uh, it, that, that's like a domestic Peace Corps group that is run by the Jesuits. And there was a, a young couple down in Chula, Mississippi, uh, that, that called us. They actually called Kathy Donahue, who was one of our staff people. She was Father Bill Davis's a niece, uh, Kathy. And she knew this couple. They called. Uh, and said that uh, began to report to us a series of events that were taking place down there. Uh, Chula, Mississippi, uh, is located about 50 miles uh, south of where uh, Sorter and Cheney were found buried uh, in a, an earthen dam uh, a, uh, a short while earlier, a couple of years earlier from this, that had been murdered by the Ku Klux Klan. They were uh, black civil rights workers down in Mississippi. Uh, and uh, the, you, you may have seen the movie, you may not, there's a movie called Mississippi Burning uh, that uh, has William Defoe and Gene Hackman uh, playing the two hero FBI guys. Uh, there weren't many of them. Uh, that, uh, but, but it's a story about uh, the murder uh, of, uh, of Swerner and Chain. Uh, and this, this series of events that were being reported to us took place about 50 miles further south, deeper into the delta uh, from where this burial site was located. Uh, Holmes County uh, is, it turns out, out of the 3,126 counties in the entire United States is the, uh, the bottom 10. It is the 10th poorest county in the entire United States. For your own edification, uh, of the other of the eleven poorest counties in the entire United States, seven of those are on the reservations, Indian reservations in South Dakota, where we're working now. For any of you that want to have a busy summer, uh, if you want to be come with us up there, yeah, that'll be uh, a charge. Uh, anyway, the, the, so the, the, anyway, the, this was the tenth poorest county in the entire United States, Holmes County. Uh, they began to report a series of events uh, that had taken place. Uh, Holmes County, as of 1981, uh, was 85% uh, black, 15% uh, white. Uh, there, was this, there was this little town called Chula, which was the county seat, which was approximately 75% black and 25% white. Uh, it, this is, now we're talking about 1981. This is the uh, Reagan-Bush era. They've been elected now, and uh, so that. But this this little town of, of Chula, 1,900 people in this town, had a railroad track it went right straight through the middle of this town. Uh, and on the <coughs> black side of the railroad tracks, the 75% of the people uh, 
lived there. The black people lived there. Uh, there were no paved roads. Uh, there was very little running water. Uh, the, the shacks that the people lived in there, you could literally see through the walls in between the boards uh, that were all tar paper and stuff in, the, in those little shacks. They had outdoor uh, toilets. Uh, and on the white side of the railroad track, where the 25% of the people lived, it was this idyllic little antebellum South town uh, had this had this cute little square with a little gazebo there and little stores and uh, this this uh, swanky little courthouse uh, with a Confederate soldier actually statue on the on the yard on the front yard of the of the uh, the courthouse uh, and uh, it had uh, Eamon Taylor uh, who was on the board of supervisors for Holmes County the white guy owned the little county store the white county store. It was there, the country store, uh, and there were like four major plantations, cotton plantations, uh, there around Chula. Uh, one of which was owned by Eamon Taylor. The other one was owned by uh, John Edgar Hayes, who was the mayor of the town uh, earlier. Uh, and it had an all-white town council, uh, despite the fact that there were 75% of the population was black. Uh, because they, they were never allowed to register to vote, uh, the black people there. Uh, so that was, the, that was the actual condition. Uh, and over in the white part of town, they had their own little bank, they had their stores, they had their little square. Uh, and the, the uh, police department, uh, the chief of police, was the uh, brother-in-law of the mayor, John Edgar Hayes. Uh, the the uh, deputies were all white. Uh, in the town. The county prosecutor was white, uh, the judge was white, they were all white. Everybody who ran the town uh, was white. Everybody who ran the county was white. But as it turned out, uh, in 1980, uh, there began to be trouble in their little paradise down there. Uh, because uh, in the spring of 1977, uh, the over on the black side of the railroad tracks, there was a little tiny country store that was owned by uh, the Carthan family. Uh, and Mr. Carthan, uh, the older man, died, the father died uh, in spring of 1977. And his oldest son, Eddie James, Eddie James Carthan, uh, who had graduated from Old Miss uh, College, the university, in 1975, had gone on to law school at Old Miss. Uh, for 1978 and 79, uh, so that uh, that earlier in the spring, uh, his, when the fa his father died, he had to leave law school, and he came back to uh, Chula, Mississippi, in Holmes County, uh, and he brought with him uh, a fellow undergraduate from Old Miss that had been one of his classmates, uh, Arnett Lewis. Uh, and uh, Eddie had gone on to law school, and when he was going to Ole Miss Law School, uh, uh, Arnett Lewis had become an organizer with the Southern Christian Leadership Council. And, uh, and he was organizing black voter registration drives in the South. And so when Eddie had to come home from law school to take over running and managing the black little county store on the black side of the railroad tracks, he brought uh, Arnett with him, and uh, Arnett was this great dude, like about you know, five foot ten, two hundred and fifty pounds, little round <coughs> cannonball. Uh, he used to go around in these blue bib overalls and those uh, big orange work shoes, and uh, organize the people to vote. And uh, they had uh, they had proved to be successful. Uh, they registered ninety percent of the eligible black voters. Uh, in uh, Holmes County, uh, thereby transforming the ratio of black to white voters from 98% white to 75% black and 25% white uh, in the district uh, by the end of 1977. Uh, and then in the fall of 1977, with Arnett Lewis being his campaign manager, uh, Eddie Carthan ran for the office of mayor of uh, Chula, Mississippi, the county seat in Holmes County. 
uh, and he won uh, by approximately 75% of the vote. <laughs> uh, and the town council, uh, which had previously been all white, uh, two black members of the town council were elected. Uh, a woman who, I'm going, to, I'm going to use the name for her, Elizabeth Brown, uh, was elected to the, to the council. Uh, and a fellow by the name of Roosevelt Granderson. Roosevelt Granderson was the basketball coach at the all-black school. And the all-black school had this terrific all-black basketball team. But they were never allowed to play against any of the white high schools uh, in the area. Uh, but, but Roosevelt Granderson was elected and Elizabeth Brown was elected. Uh, there were three white people that still remained on the town council, so it was three to two, with three white people and two black people, uh, and Mayor Carthian uh, became the mayor. And when he came to office in January of 1978, per the constitution of the town, he uh, removed the chief of police uh, and appointed a black chief of police, uh, Howard Huggins. Uh, and he removed the three uh, white deputies and replaced them with two black deputies and a white deputy, a different guy. And he began, uh, as the new mayor, to solicit outside uh, businesses to come into Holmes County, to come into Chula, to provide employment for the black community there. Because the, the people in the black community had no source of, of employment other than the four white plantations that were there, that were owned by Eamon Taylor and John Edgar Hayes and these other guys. And so, so uh, Eddie Carthian, uh, for example, tried to, uh, he got major grants to set up a bowling pin factory <laughs> to make wooden bowling pins and employ people from the community there. Uh, he got uh, some grants to set up a, a daycare center and opened a, a racially integrated uh, daycare center. You can imagine how many white Africans they had, uh, but he, he, they, this, the, the, the organizing of these outside businesses to come in to give employment to the black community, of course, challenged in a fundamental way the domination of the white plantation owners uh, in, that, uh, in that town and in that, uh, in that whole county. And uh, now, this fellow, Roosevelt Granderson, who was the basketball coach at the school, uh, it turns out that in the summertime, when school was out of session, he worked for Eamon Taylor, the white owner of the big white uh, country store on the white side. So he worked for him. And, uh, and so that uh, the, uh, John Edgar Hayes, now the former mayor and big plantation owner, and Eamon Taylor joined together to try to get Roosevelt Granderson to run for mayor the next, the next election against Eddie Carthan. Uh, and uh, during this period of time, Eddie Carthan uh, became, uh, in, in 1980, by 1980, uh, 81, he had become quite a celebrity because he was, in fact, the first elected black mayor in the deep delta of Mississippi since the, since the American Civil War and Reconstruction. Over 100 years, there hadn't been an elected black mayor. And so he, he became quite a celebrity with the National Conference of Black Mayors. And when Reagan and Bush came to office, uh, Reagan and Bush uh, established a special task force inside the United States Justice Department uh, investigating potential corruption on the part of black state elected officials. And they began a major campaign going around the country uh, mounting investigations of the spending of the black, uh, newly elected black uh, mayors, uh, black judges, a black city council people around the country. For example, they, they, uh, they unseated Alcee Hastings, elected black judge in, uh, in Florida, who is now the congressman uh, from, that, from that district. Uh, and they, they, they undertook this kind of activity. They were basically waging war uh, on behalf of the, the new administration against the elected black officials, all throughout the South especially, in support of this, this uh, new uh, Southern strategy that the Republican Party had of trying to convert uh, former Dixiecrats, the white uh, deep south people who were strangely enough in the Democratic Party and had been for a long time. 
And so that Richard Nixon had mounted this, this campaign and the Reagan and Bush administration continued it. And so what they did is they were targeting these new elected black uh, mayors in, in the city council people and in, in county supervisors throughout the South to try to remove them as Democrats and to get the white Dixiecrats to change over to the Republican Party. And so this entire thing was going on uh, in uh, 1980 and 1981. Uh, and in, in the summer of 1981, uh, uh, Mayor Eddie Carthan, for the first time now, actually agreed to leave the county and go with Arnett Lewis and some of his staff to the National Conference of Black Mayors. That they'd been inviting him for a long time and his kind of notoriety was rising around the country. So he actually <coughs> got together with Arnett Lewis and several of their staff and they went to uh, the National Conference of Black Mayors. Uh, what happened was uh, immediately the former mayor, John Edgar Hayes, and Eamon Taylor, organized a, an armed mob of white vigilantes and they basically marched down the street uh, into the police department next to the courthouse on the white side of uh, the railroad tracks uh, uh, led by uh, John Edgar Hayes' brother-in-law who was the former chief of police and his three white deputies and uh, they attacked the, 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 the courthouse, the, the police station part of the courthouse and they broke the doors down and dragged uh, Howard Huggins out into the street along with his three black deputies and beat them up and threw them in the street and went in and occupied the police department. And the, uh, and the, uh, the city, the town council, uh, called a special emergency session and uh, didn't notify either of the two black people that were on the town council. So the three, the three white people came together as the quorum and they voted to uh, reinstate the, the white police chief and all three of his deputies. Uh, and they had an emergency motion to cut off all funding to the mayor's office, which they did. Uh, they, they terminated his entire budget uh, and, and said that he'd been making calls to outside agitators and that therefore they cut off all of his funding. When, uh, when Eddie Carthan uh, was called about what had happened, he and Arnett Lewis and the staff, they returned to Holmes County, came back to Chula, and they organized uh, a major march uh, against the police department. And they marched uh, down the street, uh, led by the, the uh, black chief of police, Howard Huggins, and the two black deputies, uh, and ten special deputies that had been deputized by Mayor Eddie Carthan. Uh, and they went into the police department and uh, seized the trespassers and dragged them out and threw them in the street. And uh, immediately the white district attorney, uh, Frank Carlson, filed the district attorney's criminal complaint charging them all with felony assault of a law enforcement officer uh, uh, and destruction of government property uh, to whip the door. Uh, and, uh, and he charged the Mayor Eddie Carthan with criminal conspiracy for facilitating this by deputizing them. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the uh, state police, the state police sent in uh, 20 uh, police cars of state troopers uh, <coughs> under the direction of Clifford Finch, the governor uh, of Mississippi, who turns out to have been uh, the roommate of uh, John Edgar Hayes in college at Ole Miss. Uh, sends in the police and the, the state troopers arrested them uh, and uh, put them on a trial for assaulting police officers. And uh, a black attorney from nearby Greenville, Mississippi, about 100 miles away, who was in fact a uh, classmate at law school with Eddie Carthan, uh, Johnny Walls. Uh, and was a former uh, undergraduate at Old Miss with both, with both uh, Eddie Carthan and uh, Arnett Lewis, uh, came over from Greens Greenville to defend them and put in motions to dismiss on the obvious grounds that these other people were not police officers to begin with. Uh, and so they ended up dismissing the charges against them, uh, uh, and they went back to being the mayor, and uh, in the and uh, the, the tempers were running very, very hot. 
uh, by the uh, by the end of uh, the summer of 1981. Uh, that uh, by uh, 1980 rather. Uh, and, and what happens now is that on the night uh, on the, the 4th of July weekend, I told you we got this call uh, just after the 4th of July weekend. On the 4th of July weekend of 1981, uh, they're in the summer now. Roosevelt Granderson, who is the fellow who was one of the two black people on the town council and was the black basketball coach at the black high school and was the candidate who worked for Eamon Taylor that the white power structure was getting set to run against Eddie in the, in the fall, in the election. He is working over the 4th of July weekend at the little Jitney Junior, which is a, uh, a little quick stop place, a little gas station and a uh, little food place uh, owned by Eamon Taylor in addition to his little county, county store. And uh, about 11.45 at night, uh, on the Sunday night, July 5th, the end of the 4th of July weekend in 1981, about 11.45, uh, Granderson and the two young women, Rosie and Annie, who worked at the store with him, uh, were getting set to close up and to start cleaning up, mop the floor and clean up everything, uh, when the town fire siren goes off. The sirens start going off, and, uh, and Roosevelt Granderson in, was also on the volunteer fire department as a member of the town council and a, and a kind of a, uh, a, an activist person in the community. He was on the volunteer fire department, so he basically takes off his little apron and throws it aside and tells Rosie and Annie that he's got to go uh, fight this fire for them to go ahead and close the place up and uh, start cleaning up, and he'd be back. So he takes off, and he goes off to fight the fire, and he's gone for about an hour, a little better than an hour, uh, and the fire had been uh, in a, an old tool shed on the far side of the town, on the, uh, on the, the white side of town, uh, and it had obviously been set. It was arson. And they all got the fire put out, and he comes back, so about maybe 12.30 at night, uh, 12.30 at night, uh, actually the following morning on July 6th, he comes back to the little Jitney Jr. and he bangs on the door. And Rosie and Annie are going around mopping the floor and stuff. And there's you know, little bandanas on, their little aprons, and they're cleaning it all up. And they hear him knocking on the door. <clears throat> and so Rosie turns around and he's knocking at the door. And so she's going to start putting him on. And so she kind of just ignores him and continues to mop on the floor. So he keeps pounding on the door. And so finally she goes over to the door and she looks up at him and she says, no, 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 thank you. We gave it the office. And she turns around and she starts walking away from him like this. And he's going, come on, come on, open the door. And so he rattles the door like this. And she says, okay, okay. She goes back and she unlocks the door and opens it up. All of a sudden, he gets pushed into the room. He goes basically flying into the room and lands on the floor. And here are these two black dudes standing there behind him. This, this one guy, about maybe 5'10", you know, 190, big no-neck dude. Like this in these, in, in these uh, blue jeans and, and flannel shirt. So, and he's got this, this red bandana around his face with a 357 Magnum. And there's this little dude that's with him, like about maybe 5'5", five, five, and, uh, and totally swanky dressed dude in these slacks and this great sports jacket. And he's got this uh, purple uh, bandana around the bottom of his face with these little yellow polka dots on it. Uh, and and these, these fabulous green eyes, these kind of like broken glass green eyes that she, that she recognized, Rosie, and, uh, and, a, and a big 44 Magnum. And they come pushing in the thing, they order the two to lie down on the floor, and the little dude goes over and grabs up Rosie, and he says, okay, and he puts the gun in her face, and says, where's the money? And so he picks her up and drags her back into the back room, uh, where there's a safe in there, makes her open the, open the safe, actually beats her on the side of the head with a gun because she didn't want to open the safe to begin with. But he does that. She opens up the safe and uh, gives him the money. And he drags her back out and throws her down the floor. And he, he looks at the stuff and he says, is this all? Is this all? And she starts whining something and he, he's really upset. And then Granderson says something to the floor. And the guy runs over and then gets the big no-neck dude. And they grab him up and they drag him back into the back room and kneel him down and blow his brains out uh, with a 44 Magnum all over all the cereal boxes in the back, right? And then they come stomping back out, and they go in behind the cash register, and they open up the, there's another cash register, there's another safe on the floor. 
and they open this thing up and take a bunch of more money out of it, and then they run out and they say, if you get up off the floor, you know, within an hour, we'll come back and kill you. And they run away. They flee into the night. So Rosie and Annie are in hysterics there, you know, sitting on the floor, you know, and over their face on the floor, waiting and waiting and waiting, and almost an hour later, some some tourist people come by and they see all the lights on and the little Jimmy Jr. and they pull in to try to get something, and they come in and find them on the floor in hysterics. So they call they call the police, and Howard Huggins comes over, the town police guy, and within five minutes, right behind him, is John Edgar Hayes. And John Edgar Hayes shows up. And he's got Eamon Taylor with him, and he's got the the uh, the three former deputies, uh, the white guys, are with him. And he's st stomping around the store, saying, "Yeah, this is this is Eddie Carthen, this is Eddie Carthen, and his niggers. They're the ones that did this. They're the ones that did this. They killed him, obviously, because they wanted to run against him in the election. And so they start going all around town, talking about that all the next day, right? And so we get this telephone call." Uh, from the, the young Jesuit Volunteer Corps couple. They, they call up Kathy Donahue and they say, look, there's real trouble going on down here. You know, that the even Taylor and uh, John Edgar Hayes are going all around everywhere telling everybody that Eddie Carthan has murdered this guy Roosevelt Granderson. We need help down here. We need help. And uh, so Kathy Donahue comes in and starts talking to me and we sit down with our board and we start talking about this. And I kept saying, look, this is like, this is like 1981. You know, in other words, this is not like 1951. You know, I mean, they're, they're not going to indict this guy on this stupid, you know, evidence like that. And there's no evidence at all against Eddie Carthan. And uh, and so I, I told him, I said, look, if call us back if anything more serious happens. Uh, and so so what happens is uh, we're we're waiting to hear what's what's going on. And the meanwhile, uh, uh, John Edgar Hayes and even Taylor organized this big funeral for Roosevelt Granderson. You know, these these white honkies are pretending that they're really heartbroken over poor Roosevelt Granderson being dead. And so they're going to have this great big funeral for him, of course, in the all-black cemetery over on the other side of the railroad tracks. They're going to have this big, center, big uh, funeral for him the following Sunday. Uh, it's going to be like on the 12th or so of July. And they bring in 20 state police cruisers with state troopers, uh, with, with uh, shotguns and riot gear and the whole nine yards because they're spreading this rumor that they have to have armed guards around the funeral because Eddie Carthan and his niggers are going to come and attack the funeral. That's what, that's what they're all saying. Okay? And so they, they relegate uh, Howard Huggins, the chief of police, to go up on Route 12 up at the, the northern end of town, or at the northeastern end of town, and guard the highway and keep, a, keep an eye on it out there. Meanwhile, they have the entire the entire cemetery completely surrounded with these 20 state troopers' cars, right? And so Howard Huggins, Howard Huggins is sitting up there, and along about the, the funeral schedule for about one o'clock, about noontime, noon 15, he's he's sitting in the little black and white that's kind of <coughs> pulled across the road there, and uh, this uh, this pickup truck starts coming down the road, driving down into Chula, coming in from the northern end of town. Is coming into town, and, and, and Huggins is watching it and watching it. And they, they pull up to him, and they kind of slow down. They go off the road a little bit and to go around his cruiser. And he looks in, and there are these these four black dudes uh, in the truck. Two guys in the in the in the inside of the pickup truck with these blue jumpsuits and black baseball caps pulled down with big uh, uh, mirror sunglasses. And in the back, when they go by him, he looks, and here's these two other guys sitting in the back. I just with these black baseball caps and mirror sunglasses and blue jumpsuit, right? And they're kind of driving away. So he takes down the license number and he call he calls up the NCIC National Information Center and runs a check on the license plate. Okay, turns out the 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 uh, pickup truck had been stolen uh, seven o'clock that morning over in Lexington. And, uh, and so Howard Huggins goes, "Oh shit, you know <laughs> this is really bad. Here they are driving into this town." And so what he does is he gets it, he's in his little black and white, and he pulls the car out of the highway, and he starts driving kind of slowly along behind these guys. And uh, as he starts getting closer and closer, they start to kind of accelerate away from him. And so he turns on the little gumball on the car, you know, and, uh, and, and whacks the siren a little bit. And all of a sudden, this, this 
thing just kind of explodes away from him. The big blue pickup truck just kind of peels rubber, pours smoke at him, and they go screaming down the highway. And they go all the way down the highway, and they turn and they go up over the railroad tracks and down into the town. And they come screaming into the middle of the center of this little town, where this little nifty little center is of this town. And they peel this great big brody around into the, into the thing. And there's a woman sitting there, a white woman sitting in a little yellow pickup truck. The two guys in the back jump out. They run over to the pickup truck. They throw open the door, and they grab her, and they drag her out of there and throw her down. And they jump into the yellow pickup truck. And the blue pickup truck and the yellow pickup truck start screaming her out of the middle of the center of town. And here comes Howard Huggins kind of going real slow, coming up over the top of the hill with his siren going and his little gumball going. And he's on the radio calling like mad to the state police for them to get over there, that there's something going on in the middle of town. And, uh, and nothing's happening. And so he's chasing them down like this. And they get, out over, they get over back to the railroad track. And they get to the railroad crossing. And a train has come. So a train is coming down through the, it cuts them off. So the train is coming and they, and they pull up to the train and they're sitting there with the, with the blue pickup truck, with the yellow pickup truck right behind them and they can't get across. And so here's Howard Huggins kind of coming up kind of slowly behind them, trying to figure out what to do, calling like mad, uh, mayday, mayday, calling for the state police to come in to help him. And the guys in the blue pickup truck drive up actually on the, literally on the side of the railroad track, trying to drive along sideways next to the train and they, they, they get stuck. And so they jump, they jump up out of the blue pickup truck and they turn around and Howard Huggins is coming around the corner like this and they whip out these 30 M1 carbines with these big 50 shot banana clips and slap the banana clips in and open fire on Howard Huggins and blow off the windshield of his car, blow out the tires and shoot the gumball off the top of the car. Well, he's screaming like mad. He jumps out of the car with a microphone in his hand gets down under the car and is screaming, you know, for the for the state police to come there, right? And so these guys casually walk over and one of them lights up a big Molotov cocktail, which he's got with him, this great big bottle with a big rag hand up, he lights up the Molotov cocktail, comes over and throws it into the police car and fire bombs the police car. And it lights it on fire. And they're hugging under the car, screaming for help. And these guys will lit his car on fire and then they walk back over and there's a, a for real, <laughs> a red Corvette stingray is sitting there in line waiting to, for the train to go by. And they go in and they put the gun in the, in the window and drag the guy out of it. And the two of them get in the stingray. And the, the train then starts to clear. And the, the police have all started coming on the other side of the train. They've got like about 20 state police cars all lined up on the other side. And as soon as, as, soon as the, the train clears, this, this big bet just basically explodes and just goes blam right out of there and goes shoots right by them. It takes off like going 120 miles an hour right straight past them. And the little yellow pickup truck with the other two dudes behind in it come up right behind them and they get up behind the Corvette and they're going full speed and all the police are kind of freaking out. They turn around and start chasing them. And they're chasing them down the highway, down Route 12. And so here's the, uh, here's the little yellow pickup truck driving back and forth and back and forth and back and forth across the road blocking all the police, keeping them from catching the vet. And the vet just takes off out of sight, man, just screams away, like now going probably 130 miles an hour, all the way out of sight. And it goes tearing away, but the little yellow pickup truck is going back and forth and back and forth in front of these 20 police cars now, who are all trying to figure out how to catch them. And they go cr cruising around, they, they turn into a big cotton field, and they go through this cotton field with the police chasing behind them, and it's like Smokey and the band there, right? Going after these guys, and they go onto this dirt road, and they go down in by the swamp and hit a tree. And the two guys jump out and run into the swamp. And the, the bat tears, tears away and goes off on about 10 miles up the road and goes on up the side road up to where this big church is. They climb out and there's a car sitting there waiting for them with this woman in the car for them. They climb out. They, they take off all their blue jumpsuits and their glasses and their hats, toss them into the stingray and pick out, whip out these big Molotov cocktails and firebomb the Corvette and light it on fire. And they get in the other car and escape and drive away. So in come the bloodhounds, in come the, the helicopters, in come, you know, like 400 state police come in from all around. They come swarming into this place and they're going down into the swamps looking for these other two dudes, right? And they got bloodhounds on them and they search all through there all Sunday, Sunday afternoon, searching through all their Saturday, and they've got roadblocks up everywhere all around. And uh, Arnett Lewis, get stopped at one of these roadblocks. 
by the uh, by the Mississippi State Police, and uh, he's got a 45 under the seat in his car, and uh, he's kind of traumatized that they stopped him, and he's afraid he's going to get caught with this thing, but he doesn't. So he gets out after he gets away, goes through the roadblock, and he gets up and he goes to see uh, Sister Carol, one of the Marion sisters with whom the Jesuit volunteers have been working. She calls us uh, in a panic and asks us to come down uh, because all hell is breaking loose down here, that they need to get down here because they're afraid that somehow Mayor Carthan is going to get indicted, uh, you know, because everybody's crazy down here now. And so I'm still saying, you know, well, I can't believe they're going to indict him. You know, I don't know what all this stuff is about, what's going on here. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do, do keep in touch with us, let us know what's happening, right? And so what happens is for two days, they're searching around for these guys. And all of a sudden, after about three days, uh, one of the, these, a great big black guy in blue bib overalls comes stumbling out of the swamp, all snake bitten, mosquito bitten, and kind of freaking out. And they arrest the guy. And they drag him in. They bring him back to Chula. And they bring him into the police, the police station. And Frank Carlton, the local white district attorney, comes in and starts wailing on this guy. And telling him, he said, "Look, at, uh, we know that you're one of Carthan's guys. You know, all you got to do is all you got to do is say that Carthan put you up this. We know you're the guys that killed Granderson. We know you killed Granderson. Just you know, confess it and say that that Car Eddie Carthan <coughs> put you up to this, and we'll we'll dismiss the murder charges against you. You know, we'll we'll just charge you with like like assaulting this police officer. You know that you guys did. You know the police car. You know, but just you know, just tell us that Eddie Carthan did this." And the guy said to him, like. Who's Eddie Carthan? <laughs> he says, don't try to pretend to me you don't know who Eddie Carthan is. And he starts explaining who Eddie Carthan is. Just tell us that he's the guy that put you up to this and we'll dismiss these charges against you, the murder charges, you know? And so he said, I don't know who Eddie Carthan is. And so they keep working on him. Turns out there's this young black kid, like 15-year-old kid, who's sitting in the other cell watching this take place, right? And he's been thrown in for stealing a pair of socks out of Eamon Taylor's county store. So he's sitting there. He hears the entire thing going on. And so what he does is that later on in the day, he gets a telephone and he calls out and he calls Sister Carol and Fran and tells them that, that, uh, that the district attorney, you know, uh, the Frank Carlton, is trying to make this guy blame Eddie Carthan for this. So they get on the phone and call us and uh, Arnett Lewis flies up to Washington and comes to, comes to a Rupe house and asks us to come down to help them uh, around, this around the 17th of July or so. Uh, and I keep telling him, I can't believe that they're going to have the gall to try to indict Eddie Carthan. Uh, you know, I mean, because just a, a, a charge by the district attorney isn't going to hold up. He has to be indicted. And so what Frank Carlton does, Frank Carlton, the white district attorney, brings in, brings in 24 people, black people, off the, uh, the voter registration, the new voter registration. And he starts walking back and saying, oh, you, you folks now are all registered to vote. You know, you're now responsible citizens. You've been hearing all these rumors going on around about how Eddie Carthan is the one that uh, killed Roosevelt. You, you've all heard about that, all those rumors going around. They're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He said, now you want to give Eddie a chance to answer, don't you? You know, all these kind of rumors going around about him, about him getting a chance to defend himself. You want him to get a chance to answer for that, don't you? And they said, yeah, yeah, well, we, we want him to get. So here, sign this right here. And so he said, and it turns out that they're indictments. And he had impaneled them as a grand jury. And so Eddie Carthan is indicted for first-degree murder, uh, and, there, and he demands the, uh, the gas chain for Eddie, Ch for, for Eddie Carthan. We then decide it's time to come down, obviously. Uh, and so we, we come on down there. Uh, we fly into Jackson uh, around the 21st or so of July. Uh, we, go, we go on over immediately. Uh, we're in Jackson, so we go to see Charles Tisdale. Charles Tisdale is the, the, a, a major force in, the, in Mississippi. He's the, he's the editor-in-chief of the, the Jackson Advocate. Uh, it was a major paper that had been very active in supporting civil rights workers and had, had hounded the state to try to get after these Klan guys that killed uh, Cheney, in the, uh, Sorter and Cheney. Uh, so we went to see him to pay homage to him and have a lot of discussions with him and tell him that we're going down into Chula. And he said, be careful. He said, that is Klan country, where you're going down into there. And so we go driving on down with Sister Carol and Fran. That uh, I've got, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, Louis Pitts was with me and Father Bill Davis uh, to the start. We go down in, 
And here's this amazing place, you know, driving down into this little this little country, but with gudzu all over everything. Now gudzu is this bizarre plant that grows. It's all green leafy plant, and it's covering the trees, and it's covering the fields, and it's covering, it's just like this. It's like this kind of bizarre, a, a dreamlike place down here. And we come driving into this little town with the, with all these uh, these picturesque this picturesque little courthouse and all these wonderful things. And so I go over to the, the, the courthouse, to the jail, and uh, I uh, I go in to see Eddie Carthen. I'm going to represent him in the in the, the criminal charges, the murder case. And Howard Huggins says that he's been instructed by John Andrew Hayes that nobody can see him uh, because he's under protective custody because uh, the, 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 the white people are so mad that they may want to try to kill him. They might want to try to come to the jail and lynch him. Uh, and so that he's under protective custody and even his own lawyer can't see him. <laughs> so I said, oh really? You know, uh, so, we, so we sit down, I go, over, I go over to see Elizabeth Brown, the, the lady on the city council, uh, the town council, and we begin to talk about what's going on. We begin to bring our people down uh, Sarah, Sarah comes down with both of our, our boys. Uh, Danny Fall was, I think, about five by that time. Uh, Dagan, uh, our, our little guy, was like two years old. He wasn't even walking yet. Uh, we, just, we looked around. We ended up getting a little old farmhouse uh, outside of Chula. Uh, and we all started moving in and setting up. There was a professor that had it that was all on sabbatical somewhere. He let us stay there. And uh, we, we set up camp there. Uh, I remember we had little ironing boards up that we were using for desks, and uh, we, we, set, we set up all this stuff. And, uh, and we didn't have any security, because Billy Taylor uh, was actually in the hospital, because he'd actually ruptured uh, something when he picked up this big anvil and crunched this dude <laughs> over in the Greensboro case, right? So he's sitting in the hospital with his legs up in traction with his big hiney having been operated on from this big hernia that he got from this uh, So so we, we don't have any security down here, right? So so we're all laughing and talking about now we aren't even able to go into town to order a loaf of bread because if you order like wheat bread or some other kind of bread uh, other than Wonder Bread, it'd be probable cause. <laughs> so so we're so we're we're starting to put we're starting to put our team together. We're trying to figure out what's going on here, right? So we we start talking with Elizabeth Brown. We start talking to all the people in town, and this strange. Strange kind of thing descends around the whole community. That uh, I, I finally, they finally agreed to let Eddie Carthane come up into the courtroom, and I can interview him in the courtroom. And I go up and I start saying to Eddie, I said, "What the hell is going on? You know, what's happening here? What's what?" He's look. He said, uh, "I didn't do this. I didn't do it." And uh, I'm, I'm confident <coughs> you guys can uh, can uh, get these charges uh, off me. Uh, but you know, I'm not. I'm not talking. He wouldn't talk to me. Wouldn't tell me what was going on. Wouldn't explain what was going on. Anything. So I go find Arnett Lewis, and Arnett says, uh, "Well, you're going to have to talk to Elizabeth Brown. You know, she knows everything. She's the grandmother of the town. She knows all this stuff." So we go and start talking with her. We can't figure out what's going on. They don't want to talk to us. Uh, uh, and and the, the reality is, is that the the people that were there, uh, most of the people had not had a lot of experience with white people. Uh, because they had been so radically segregated from uh, from the white community that they that they just had this instinctive distrust of anybody white, I had to agree with them. You know, I said, "I think you're right." You know, so so uh, I was trying to figure out how we were going to get this information. So I go I go fly back up to the Washington D.C. and i had been teaching his law class at law school, and so I, I end up I end up uh, get, getting getting a hold of Mel Gibbs. Mel Gibbs was one of my law students in my class at, at law school, and uh, he was like about 35 years old. He had been a police detective in New York City, and had actually been the principal organizer of the New York City Black Patrolmen's Association. And he'd been basically railroaded out of the police department down in New York for having done that. Uh, and so he decided he'd better go to law school. <laughs> I agreed with him on that too. And so he'd come to law school in Washington D.C. and he was one of my students. And so uh, I went to I went to see him and I said, "Look, you've got investigator experience. You know, you're a, you're a detective, a, a licensed detective. Uh, I need you to come on down with me, and uh, you can get some special credit 
But of course, uh, I'll, 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 I'll uh, let you get away without writing one of your papers. You know? <laughs> there, so, so, so he agrees so to come down. So he comes down with us, you know, and he starts going around trying to figure out what's going on. And he's talking to Bill Taylor with Bill Taylor with his legs sticking up in the <laughs> hospital and you know, all the interaction. And, and so he's, he's talking with him. And the, 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 uh, about one of the, well, I guess, fifth or sixth of the night when we were down there, uh, all of a sudden, late at night, we started, uh, it was getting dark around the house. All of a sudden, we saw these lights like going on and off and on and off everywhere. So we all go out to the windows, and it turns out there were like about 30 uh, clan cars that had come. And they were driving out around the house like this with their lights going on and off and on and off and on and off and on and off and on and off. And, on. and, uh, and uh, I remember that that was the night that uh, Dagan, our younger boy, uh, took his very first steps. <laughs> I would have run too. <laughs> but he, he actually got up and started walking around looking at the lights and stuff. That was the very first steps he'd ever taken. And so, uh, so I get on the phone and I call Billy Taylor and I say, uh, Billy, here's the situation that we've got here. Uh, and uh, within a matter of a few hours, uh, we had six uh, fully armed uh, guards with M16 fully automatic rifles uh, standing on our front porch that had been uh, <coughs> sent in by Bill Taylor. Uh, and uh, Bob Hayde, uh, one of the main guys, helped organize them. A very famous jazz uh, saxophone guy. Anyway, they, they came in uh, and set up a cordon all around the house to, to protect us. And so we went deep into the investigation trying to figure out what was going on. And, uh, and it turns out that what had happened is this. We discovered that what had happened is in about 1979 or so, the bottom had dropped out of the cotton market. And so these big four... Uh, white plantations that were around there, uh, basically they couldn't make it by producing cotton anymore. So they couldn't employ the black people, they couldn't make any money, and so what they had done is they decided that they were going to grow marijuana. Hmm. No. And so what they were going to do is they were going to maintain kind of the cotton fields on the outside, but they were going to grow marijuana on the whole inside of all their, their places. And they had set up this whole business where they were actually growing this rather B minus grade marijuana, uh, from what I've heard. Uh, it was not, not real high quality stuff, lots of seeds and sticks. Anyway, it was, it was not really good. And so, so they, they were in the process of, of selling this stuff. And what they would do is they would actually uh, construct these fake big cotton bales uh, on the outside that were all completely filled with big bales of marijuana. And they'd put them on the trucks and they'd drive them right out of there. And they were driving them all over the south, and they were selling uh, marijuana. And it, and it turns out uh, that what had happened is uh, we discovered, as we got deeper into this thing, that the United States Central Intelligence Agency, which is now finally giving me a little more satisfaction of being involved in this case to begin with, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency uh, has struck a deal with the reactionary governor of the state, uh, uh, Finch, uh, Clifford Finch, to uh, allow marijuana to be brought up from Jamaica, ganja, I mean real quality stuff from Jamaica, brought up and in, in smuggled into the cotton fields, coming in in these low flying planes, coming in under the radar, landing in the cotton fields, down there around Chula, Mississippi, and they were unloading the Jamaican ganja, and they were bringing the, 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 three, the three white police detectives in the, that were formerly there in the police department, and the white chief of police, the brother-in-law of John Edgar Hayes, would actually drive the police cars out to the airstrips, and uh, they brought the ambulance with them the emergency ambulance they had for the police department, and they would load it up with this uh, ganja. And they would bring it to the all-white cemetery, uh, and they would have this fake funeral. And they would go and they would open up this great big mausoleum thing they had there, this, this crypt of some sort, and they were loading the, the ganja into the place and storing it. So that when they then gathered up all their little B-grade marijuana, they would take this additional ganja and they were smuggling it out of there because the American Central Intelligence Agency wanted to provide covert funding 
for Edward Siega, this right-wing pig who was running against uh, Michael Manley. This, I, I take that back, I, fascist. <laughs> okay, that's what he was. And uh, in the Central Intelligence Agency, they decided they wanted to set up a covert means of providing funds for Edward Siega uh, without any authorization from Congress. And so they, they opened up this pathway to have uh, Edward Siega's people smuggling a ganja into the United States using the cover of this pre-existent white plantation owner marijuana smuggling operation that was going on. But what happened is, as happens almost all the time, once the avenue had gotten opened up, they said, hey, this is such a free pass that we've got here with the agency you know, standing down the DEA and letting us do this that why not bring in a little bit of cocaine with it? And why not bring in a little bit of Mexican brown heroin with it? And which they did. And they started bringing in heroin, they started bringing in cocaine, and they, the, the police were picking it up. The white police guys have been picking it up and bringing it into the little mausoleum and storing it there. And so they were making bunches of money. And as it turns out, uh, that what happened is that the, the white plantation owners had, uh, this is uh, Eamon Taylor and uh, John Edgar Hayes, had decided to get Roosevelt Granderson, who was the basketball coach at the black school, <clears throat> to distribute marijuana for them into the black community using his basketball players. And that uh, nobody wanted to talk about this because all of a sudden the people had lots of employment. The people were working in the in the fields like they have been with the cotton. Uh, the the white plantation owners were making money. They were employing the people, and nobody wanted to talk about this because nobody figured it really meant anything, right? It, what, what's it got to do with anything, right? And so then we come in and, uh, and with uh, that, that uh, Mel Gibbs then started asking questions, and we started working together, and we said. Who the hell is this dude, this big dude that they arrested climbing out of the swamp here? Who the hell is this guy anyhow? Well, it turns out his name was Vincent Bolden. Uh, and, uh, and what we did is we got to Taylor. Uh, he's, Taylor's pretty good, even flat on his back. And so he started making calls to figure out what's going on. We find out that this guy, Vincent Bolden, he runs him on the uh, NCIC and stuff. And he finds out that he's part of this gang up in East St. Louis. Uh, the Hester game. And uh, they're big hijackers uh, and they're into uh, drug trafficking, cocaine mainly. And so we figured that this guy Bolden, we started, we started checking up on him and Billy was doing all the investigation. We discovered the guy that ran this game that Vincent Bolden was part of was a guy named David Hester. And the thing that everybody knew about David Hester is that he had these remarkable eyes that were these broken glass green eyes. And he was this total fancy dresser all the time. So I go over to talk with, uh, with Rosie uh, and with Ann, who were the two young women that were the, the assistants to Roosevelt Granderson at the Jitney Jr. on the night of, uh, of July 5th. So I go over to sit down with him, and I'm talking to Rosie. I said, now, Rosie, I want you to slow this down, and I want you to go step by step about what happened that night. Right? And so she starts telling me. She's telling about how they're all getting ready to clean up and close the place up and fire siren goes off and, and Roosevelt goes off to go do this and they're cleaning up and then like 12, 15 or so he comes back and uh, I said, okay, I'm take it nice and slow. I said, okay, now he came over, he, he, he pounded on the door to come in, right? And she said, yes. I said, but you didn't, you didn't go over to let him in right away. She said, no, 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 I was kidding around. I was just going to kid around a little bit. And, uh, and so I let him pound on the door again, and I went back over to the door, and there he was standing in the door, and, uh, and, uh, and she, she, then I said some stuff to him, and I said, what'd you say? What'd you say to him? And she said, we, we gave it the office. <laughs> I said, really? She said, I was just kidding around with him. I said, you were joking around with him? And she said, yes. And then it hit me. And I said to her, you were joking with him. He wasn't afraid, was he? She said, you know, he wasn't. I said, really? I said, he's got two guys standing behind him with a 357 Magnum and a 44 Magnum in his back, and he wasn't afraid? She said, no, he wasn't. 
She said, okay. She unlocks the door and they throw him in and they throw him on the floor and she goes through the whole routine about taking him to get the money and all that. So then we came back and she said, uh, and then they were getting set to leave. The guy was upset because there wasn't very much money from this safe in the back. And, and I said, but then Roosevelt uh, said something, right? He said something. She said, yeah, I don't know what he said. He said something. And so I go to talk to Annie. And Annie was lying closer to him. And so I go through the whole thing and Annie's telling me about what happened. So I said to Annie, I said, what, what did he say? What did he say from the floor? She said, he said, the real money's in the other safe. I said, what? She said, that's what he said. But the real money's in the other safe. And that's why they went into the other safe where the big money was. And then Annie remembered that actually Roosevelt had not taken the deposits from Friday night or Saturday night and brought them to the bank like he was supposed to. That he had left all of that money from the entire 4th of July weekend in the same. And I said, this is far out. This is far out. I said, so I began to inquire about this. And that's how I discovered that, in fact, Roosevelt had, in fact, been selected by Eamon Taylor and John Aker Hayes to be the distributor for the marijuana to all of the, the black community uh, using his basketball skits. And then there was this, this weird thing that kept going on. That there was this little, this young kid, uh, Willie Williams, his name was, and he, he was like retarded, like, and he used to be going up and down the street, sweeping the street with his little broom, and kind of humming and singing to himself all the time. I kept seeing him around this little town all the time. I kept saying to people, what's, what's with this guy? And people would go, oh, no, no, sorry, I don't. And I couldn't figure out what this was. So I go back, I'm talking to Elizabeth Brown, and I'm saying, hey, look, I can't quite figure out what's going on. I've got Roosevelt Granderson distributing marijuana to the, to the black community for, for the white plantation. I said, but it still doesn't make any sense. Well, what, what, what's that? What's that got to do with anything? And she said, uh, well, uh, you should talk, you should talk to, Joe, to Joe Cartley. I said, Joe Cartley? She said, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's Eddie's brother. You should talk to him. I said, what's he going to tell me? She said, you, you're going to have to talk to him. So I go back into the jail, and I get to, to Eddie Carthy, and I, I get him up in the courtroom, and I'm saying, Eddie, what the hell is going on? What's with Joe? What am I, why am I supposed to talk to Joe? He said, you don't have to talk to Joe. I don't know. I'm not going to talk to you about that. I'm not going to talk to you about that. I didn't do this, and you can get me acquitted. I know you can. He said, I didn't do it. And uh, I said, would you set up a thing where I can talk to Joe? No, I won't. So I send, I send Mel Gibbs looking for, for Joe Carthan. He's out of town. Uh, we finally find out where he is. And uh, I go track him down. And he's in a state park in some little cabin somewhere. And so I go sit down with him. And I ask him to, to come clean with me. What the hell is going on? And he said, well, what happened is about a year ago, uh, he said, I was at a local wedding. Uh, and we were at the wedding, and uh, this guy, David Hester, was there. And he was flashing these big ring, diamond rings around and strutting around in his nice clothes and all that kind of stuff. And I knew, I knew he was a gangster, and so I, you know, I'm kind of going over and trying to talk to him and, and get to talk to him, and he's kind of pushing me away and, and, and ignoring me. And so finally I, I told him, I said, you know, I, I, I can tell what you guys are trying to do. He says, that, you know, we, we, we got some stuff going on around here too, you know. And, uh, and Hester says, oh, yeah, we're like, like, what? And he says, well, you know, we got this uh, marijuana thing going, and uh, we distribute marijuana around and stuff like that. And uh, you ought to go meet this uh, Granderson guy. Granderson does have this. And, uh, and so he said, that's, uh, that's all I know. That's all I know. It's the only contact I ever had with this guy. And uh, I said, well, that's something. Uh, and so we began to try to figure out what the hell the connection was here, what was going on. And so I go back and I start asking people about this guy, Willie Williams. What's, who is this guy? You know, what's, does this have anything to do with anything? They said, well, you're, you're, going, to have to, you're going to have to talk to uh, somebody else about this. And I said, who? Who can we find out about? And finally, uh, Mel Gibbs finds a kid. He says, that everybody tells me there's this one kid uh, that's on the basketball team. You've got to go talk to this guy. And so 
uh, we go out, uh, Bill and I go out to this guy's little house over in the Black Side County. It's just, I mean, really, it, it's the, the, the entire, the entire house was like no bigger than from, from here to the wall, <coughs> period, whole, whole house. And there's a big uh, uh, blanket up over this last little quarter of the house. And the kid's mother was dying of uh, like TV uh, in the back room in the house. And he was there having to take care of her. And uh, he, it turns out, had been awarded a full scholarship to Ole Miss to play basketball. And so everybody was saying, this is a real decent kid. You know, he might tell you something. So we sit down and I start trying to talk to him about what's going on. He said, look, I can't. I can't tell you. He said, if I tell you, he said, I'll never get out of here. You know, I'll never, I'll never get to go to college. I'll, I'll lose my scholarship. I, I, I just can't do that. And I said, look, they're going to they're put Eddie in the gas chamber. You know, I, you know, I will promise you that I will do everything in my power not to have to call you. You know, if you will just tell me what is going on here. He said, well, hell, it's only a game. That's what he said. He said, it's only a game. So he told me. And he said that what happened is Roosevelt uh, was distributing this uh, marijuana for everybody uh, in, in the community. And then the cocaine started coming in. And all of a sudden, for some reason, he had lots of cocaine. But it wasn't the cocaine that was being brought in on these airplanes. It was coming from somewhere else. He had this cocaine that he was distributing around in the community in the same kind of channels that he was distributing the marijuana in. And what happened is that uh, this one kid, Willie Williams, who was on the basketball team, refused to do it. He wouldn't distribute any of the cocaine. And Roosevelt became furious with him. And he gathered all the guys on the basketball team together and brought them into the gymnasium and had him hold this kid down. And they tied, they tied his hands behind his back and they tied his feet up and he hoisted him up on, on, on this rope upside down. And he got a baseball bat and he was threatening to hit the kid in the head unless the kid would agree to distribute the, the cocaine because they couldn't have somebody holding out. And the kid wouldn't do it and wouldn't do it. And Roosevelt got so furious that he smashes this kid in the head with a baseball bat and fractures his skull and cut into his brain. And he started bleeding all over the floor. They all became terrified. They pulled him down, bring him to the hospital. He had this big operation. And he was totally uh, brain damaged forever after that. He spent his time sweeping the streets. And, uh, and Roosevelt Granderson got so freaked out that, that uh, about what he had done and that people were going to talk about it, that he started buying the kids on the basketball team and their families like colored television sets and used cars and things like that all of a sudden. And nobody could figure out where he was getting the money. Well, it turns out that what he was doing is he was skimming <coughs> the money off the cocaine profits that he was making for the Hester game. That they were piggybacking on the operation that he was doing for the white uh, plantation owners. And it turns out, un unknown to them, and unknown to all of them, for the CIA, and for, for, uh, for uh, Siega. And he had started skimming the money, and Hester figured it out. And Hester had confronted him, and what he decided to do it was set up a thing where they could come and rob the store. He would, he would keep all the money in the safe over the whole weekend, and he would put the money in the safe, and then they would come in and rob the store and get all their money back. And so they set up this whole deal where they come in to do it, but Hester got so PO'd at the guy, you know, that he basically murdered him and then walked away. And then all the rest of the stuff started happening. All the people in the, in the white community who were, who were completely racist you know, just seized upon the idea, whether they believed it or not, and they may have some, but they, but they, it was a, a great opportunity to blame it on Eddie Carthian. 
And all the people in the black community figured that it was just a big racist frame up and that, uh, that, that Eddie hadn't had anything to do with this and nobody knew anything about what had happened here. And so they were calling us in as this big would be liberal group from Washington, D.C. You know, we're going to come in and believe anything we were told to represent the black community and that we didn't have to know about any of this stuff. And so we start fighting out all of this stuff, right? And so then they get ready to bring Eddie Carthy into trial. And so, so uh, uh, Sister, Sister Mary Ellen Fitzmorris, who was one of our staff <coughs> attorneys, uh, she goes down to live with Sister Carol and Sister Fran, and she was living in, the, in the, the farmhouse with them, and she goes over to where they were selecting the jury, and she comes back to me and she says, look, uh, this, this guy who was the, was the clerk of the court, uh, this guy Calvin Moore, that I think he was palming names into the jury box for, for picking, for picking. Uh, can you guys pick ten minutes? An extra ten? Is that okay? Yeah. So can we okay. wrap it up? It's, so, so the, uh, so, uh, all right. Uh, so, so, so anyway, the, the, the bottom line is, is that uh, we get ready to go to the court, right? And then here's this this classic courtroom where it's where it's uh, right out of the deep south. It's got these these. Uh, wicker fans that are kind of going like this in the courtroom. This is at the, like in, the, in August, late August, right? It's hotter than hell. And it's got all this, in like about 98% humidity in this place, right? They got these little fans going with these little ropes hooked to it. They got these little motors going with their fanning like this. And downstairs is all completely white. All the white people sit downstairs. And the black people have to stay upstairs. And they got these little balcony like around the top where all the black people are. And we come into the, we come into the courtroom, and uh, and we get ready. They, they bring in the potential jurors. They bring in a hundred potential jurors, right? First, uh, and the the first eighty of them are all white. You know, jurors one through eighty <laughs> that we're going to have to work our way through and either excuse them for cause or use up our peremptories on them are all white. And they can march into the courtroom like this. So I jump up, and uh, the the judge the judge is up there. This is uh, Judge Arthur Clark. And I object. I say, Your Honor, uh, uh, Your Honor. And he says, No, no, Mr. Shin. No, no. Uh, I don't think we need to say anything in the record about this. I said, Absolutely, we do. I said, You know, the first 80 of these people were all white. I said, You know, I thought I was trapped in a snowstorm here. Uh, I said, You know, all the black people, they're, they're all in the back. I'll never get to those people. He said, Okay, okay, okay. Uh, look, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to do is we're going to take the whole hundred names together. We're going to mix them all up. We're going to put them in this big box. And uh, then, then we're going to have uh, the clerk, Calvin Moore, is going to pull them, draw them out again. We'll have a, a, a new arrangement here. I said, no, we're not. No, we're not going to do that. And he said, well, what? What do you mean we're not going to do that? I said, he's the guy that did it to begin with. He said, you know, and, 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 you know he was palming names into the, into the box, and I didn't believe it. And Sister Mary Ellen Morris looks over at me, and she goes, because <laughs> I hadn't believed her. Right? <laughs> and so, so I go, okay, okay. So that's what that's what he was doing. I said, and, and you know, and Sister Morris knew it. She saw it. I it said, so she said, well, he said, well, what do you want us to do then? I said, well, the fact is, we have a representative here from Amnesty International, because Mayor Carthan is only the second person in the entire history of Amnesty International uh, to of an American to be declared a political prisoner. You know, the other one is Leonard Peltier. And then and Eddie Carthen has been declared by Amnesty International to be a political prisoner. So we have an Amnesty International person here. What we'll do is we'll put all the names in the box, we'll mix them all up, and we'll have the Amnesty International representative draw out the names. So the judge says, okay, okay, we'll do that. So we get all the names, we shuffle them all up, and I'm holding the box up like this. And the, the poor guy's in shock. You know, the, this guy from Canada, who's the, the Amnesty International guy, and he comes over and he reaches up like this and pulls out 12 straight black jerks. <laughs> <laughs> and we see that the first all black jury uh, in the history of Mississippi. Wow. Okay? <laughs> so Johnny Walls, who was the classmate of Eddie and, and uh, and, and also of, uh, of uh, Arnett, we bring him in now to, to help do this trial, right? So we start going through the trial, and, and in comes, uh, in comes uh, this big 
to uh, Vincent uh, Bolden, and he gets up on the stand. The prosecution gets up on the stand and he said, "Oh yes," he said, uh, "You know, we're we're the ones that killed Roosevelt Granderson, and uh, we got paid ten thousand. I got paid. I had anybody else do it with me. I just did it by myself." Uh, this is I got Rosie and Annie. The two guys came in and killed him. And he said, "No, I did it all by myself." And, and, and the, the mayor paid me ten thousand dollars to do this. Uh, and so he gets up on the stand. And so, uh, so we then we've got Billy Billy uh, Taylor looking all over the country with his sources, trying to figure out where David Hester is. Turns out David Hester has got a a, a federal warrant out for him for uh, interstate hijacking. So U.S. Marshals that Billy knows really well, former uh, military guys, that they, they end up looking for the guy. They find the guy up in Alaska, hiding out in this big cannery up there where he's working, and uh, they arrest his ass. Excuse me, they arrest him. <laughs> and they arrest him, and the U.S. Marshals bring him back from Alaska to East St. Louis via Chula, Mississippi. <laughs> and they bring him down there for us, and we put him up on the stand. So we get him up on the stand, and uh, Johnny Waltz gets him up on the stand, and he says, uh, 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 okay, Mr. Hester, and, and Hester says, that's Reverend Hester. <laughs> Reverend David Hester, he says. He's got one of those little matchbook uh, reverend things. He signed a little license. He got one of these little matchbooks. And, that's and so, so he's going, oh, great, great, Reverend, Reverend Hester. <laughs> Uh, and here's the jury, where they're all, everybody's laughing now. And uh, so, okay, I want to, uh, and so he starts taking him through this examination uh, about, you know, did, did you meet, uh, did you meet uh, uh, Joe, Joe Carthan at this wedding? Did he tell you about, and he starts going all like this. And, and this guy is shocked that we know about all this, right? And so Johnny Walls brings him all the way along to the point where, you know, and, uh, and, and he was, uh, and so he was selling the cocaine for you, right? He was selling the cocaine for you. And uh, oh, so I, I'm not saying I was selling cocaine, and not only that, but you were so stupid that you couldn't even keep track of all the money. And this guy just kind of freaks right out on the stand, and he said, "The dirty bastard! You know, he was skinning the money right off the money for us, like that." And everybody just freezes in the courtroom like that. And he said, "Excuse me." And then he said, "Well," uh, uh, and, and Walls walked right up to me. He said, "And so you killed him, right? You killed him." He said, "You're damn right, we did." Just like that, he says. And everybody freezes in the courtroom, and, and Frank Carlton jumps up the DA and he says, Hold it, Your Honor. This is a total surprise. <laughs> <laughs> we, have to stop, we have to suspend the court uh, for a little while. So for two days, they stop the trial, right? And, and he closets with Frank Carlton. And so then they come, they, come back, they come back in after two days, and he's up on the stand. Johnny Wall said to him, Well, Reverend, he said, uh, uh, During the two day hiatus we've had here, did you have an opportunity to talk with the district attorney? <laughs> he looks around like that because he's supposed to say anything. And, and, and the judge says, you, you'll have to answer that. He says, well, yes, yes, I did. He said, did he make you any offers of any kind? And, and Carlton jumped up and said, I object, Your Honor. And I said, what do you mean you object? <laughs> I said, you know, that's a perfectly obvious question for credibility. He said, all right, all right. So the judge orders him to tell him. He says, yes, yes, yes. He, I said, can you tell, or Johnny Wall said, and what, what did he offer you? He said, well, he would, uh, uh, he would agree to wave to the files was the phrase that he used, which means dismiss, the first-degree murder charges uh, for, the, for the killing of, uh, of Roosevelt Granderson. Uh, and he would waive to the files the uh, armed robbery charge of robbing the Jitney Jr. And they would waive to the files the attempted bank robbery, which was the first time I'd heard about that. It turns out that's what they were going to do. The Hester gang was going to come in, and during the funeral, they decided they were going to rob the white bank in town. <laughs> that's what these guys were doing in the truck. And so he said, oh, we'll, we'll wave to the files uh, the first degree bank robbery charges against you guys. And uh, we'll, we'll charge you with just a uh, one count of aggravated assault against a police officer to wit Howard Huggins, you know, blowing up his car and trying to kill him. Uh, and he said, uh, uh, and is, and is that all? Is there anything else? Uh, he said, oh, uh, well, there was another thing. He, he promised me that I would be able to serve uh, whatever time I was going to. Uh, in any facility in the state of Mississippi of my choice. And so and the jury's laughing out loud by this time, right? And so finally, uh, Johnny Walls trying to say, now, was there anything else? And he said, oh, yes, yes, there was one more thing. He said, what is that? He said, he was going to give me uh, one month before I had to turn myself in so I could finish uh, uh, all my business affairs. And Johnny Walls looked at him and said, 
and your business affairs being uh, cocaine sales? He said, yes, that's right. That's what he said. And, he, and so Johnny turned around and said, okay, so you have one month before you have to turn yourself back in. How long do you think it would take you before you'd be on a flight to South America? He said, about 24 hours. <laughs> what, it, what it turned out is he'd been offered by the district attorney. All he had to do was testify, and he was completely immunized. Anything that he said that he was immunized for. And so that's what he did. And so everybody started laughing out loud about this whole thing. And we turned around and we, we rested, the defense rested, and it, it took the jury 45 minutes. They had to come back in and find him innocent, right? And when they, when they announced their verdict, the whole place basically exploded. And what had been happening over the past two days when, when we came back into the trial is all the black people started moving down from upstairs and sitting in the front row. And the whole place was filled with the black community. By the time we got done with this, and uh, and all the white people started disappearing out of the courtroom, and so when we got to the verdict, the the whole place just basically explodes, and everybody starts dancing and cheering, and the judge flew, fled the courtroom, and, 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 and so the district attorney and Shadrach Davis, this great big six foot six dude, a farmer from there, jumps up on the judge's bench and starts dancing, like this. <laughs> and, and the whole thing's on film. Uh, the CBS and John Shane came into the courtroom and filmed the whole thing. <laughs> so anyway, there's the car thing case. Uh, I thought you thought you might be interested in that. It doesn't have a lot of the same major legal issues and technicality, which I know just point you. Uh, but, but anyway, that's that's the that's the Eddie Carthay and murder trial. That's how he was acquitted of the first degree murder. <coughs> okay.